Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we will wrap the week. We'll focus on how the markets have evolved in the last five trading days. Quite a bit of distribution going into the close. The S&P actually nearing 4,500 as we're getting ready to go live here just after 4 p.m. Eastern, closing just about 4,500. That's off from where it was uh, just over the last couple of days. Plenty of choppiness, plenty of competing narratives and themes to discuss, including cryptocurrencies ripping back to the upside. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market environment using the power of stock charts, using the technical analysis toolkit to better quantify investor behavior, better understand what is happening around us as investors. And uh, you know, one of my conversations earlier this week, uh, yesterday was with Frank Capillary from Instant. We talked about elevated volatility uh, and when the market has a sell-off with the spike in volatility. It's a really interesting uh, conversation, but just made me think a lot about the volatility environment that we are in. Uh, I was interviewed for a market outlook the first week in, uh, in January, and one of the proposals I made for the year or uh, ideas was that the VIX would spend more time above 20 than below 20, just driving home how I feel like this year is, is going to be a more volatile environment than 2021 uh, had been. And so far, it's certainly seeming to be that way, just on the readings, if you look at things like the VIX, actual measures of volatility, but just simply if you look at the price action on the S&P, on the NASDAQ, some of the major averages, plenty of fluctuations, plenty of uncertainty, plenty of volatility that's uh, certainly manifesting itself in a choppy market environment. Now, we have a, a lot of great guests on our, on our show. I mentioned our conversation with Frank Capillary this week and uh, others that were a lot of fun. Next week, three great guests lined up for you. On February 8th, Tuesday, we have Sam Burns from Mill Street Research on Wednesday the 9th, Carolyn Boradin, Fibonacci Queen, joining us for the first time. On Thursday the 10th, Ryan Dietrich from LPL Research uh, will share some of the research he has been sending out to their uh, advisor network. Also, two other events to let you know about. Next week on Wednesday, February 9th, 2.30ish p.m. Eastern, I'll be doing a presentation with uh, Greg Schnell, fellow Stock Charts contributor, uh, for the Money Show Virtual Expo focused on cannabis. We are going to be doing a presentation called Trading Cannabis Stocks Using Price Momentum. We'll talk about really some of the weaker momentum characteristics we're seeing in a lot of the cannabis names, how that relates to strength you're seeing in other uh, agriculture names, things like Monsanto and uh, uh, ADM and others. Then we'll talk about what we would need to see in the cannabis stocks to become more bullish on their price characteristics. Go to stockcharts.com slash money show to sign up for that event. Also, I'll be doing a webinar with market misbehavior coming up next Tuesday, February 8th. That's at one o'clock Eastern called Breaking Down Breadth. There's a double meaning to that title, breaking down, as in we will break down the commonly used techniques and best practices looking at market breadth measures. We will also talk about how those indicators have indeed been breaking down recently. Go to marketmisbehavior.com slash breaking down breadth to sign up for that free event next Tuesday, the 8th. Let's continue on with today's market recap. We wrap the week every Friday, which is looking at how the markets have evolved from last Friday to this Friday. I did want to start, though, with a poll question. Recently, we asked you on social media, on our live stream page in stockcharts.com, uh, which of these would you rather own over the next three months? And we gave you three choices, consumer discretionary, the XLY, consumer staples, the XLP, or just in cash. Very interested to see that half of you, almost half of you, 49% said cash over either of those options. Talk about a concerning sign. If we, when we asked you that recently, and I, I should look at the last time we asked that question, it was probably uh, before, the, uh, before the holiday season. I'm quite certain cash was a non-factor. I would imagine a single-digit response to cash. Interesting how so many of us have thought more defensively. Now, when you look at that ratio, it is very much favored consumer staples over consumer discretionary, really from November, January, November through January uh, and into February now has, has certainly been favoring the relative defense and staples to the relative offense 
of discretionary, but almost half of you saying uh, I'd either I don't either of those. Uh, I don't uh, I don't cash right now. I did not respond in the poll. If I did, though, I probably would say uh, consumer staples out of all of them, although cash is a compelling option. It, it concerns me when the option to to gain zero, have a guaranteed zero on your return seems like a compelling option for so many of us. It tells you the environment that we're in for sure. Let's wrap the week here, continue on and talk about just this overall market environment. Quite a choppy day today. You had the uh, you know quick rise out of the open, trading lower, rallying pretty strong through the course of the day. And it was consumer discretionary at the top, followed by financials and energy. But look at the sell-off you had in the last 30 minutes. What concerns me about that, similar to what we saw yesterday, the market had been down a ton. And then you saw this acceleration of selling in the last 30 minutes. That tends to be when institutions are going to be making their moves. If you're at a big money manager, you don't want to be sort of putting in a big sell order right in the middle of the day because that's going to mess up the markets pretty good. You want to wait until the end of the day when the chance of rupturing the market environment is minimized. So it's concerning to me a bit that you've had a couple of days here with quite a sell off going into the close. It tells you or it suggests sort of implies that some of the bigger institutions are lightening up their positions, not adding new long positions in this environment. It sort of tells you a little something about the psychology of some of the uh, of the institutions we might look at. Uh, just elsewhere, looking at today's trading, it was sort of NASDAQ over uh, over other things very, very uh, heavily. The NASDAQ uh, composite up one and a half percent, small caps flat for the day. And that tells you a lot about the relative movement of some of these uh, some of these different areas. Interest rates higher in a big way, getting above 190. That's a new high here uh, for the last uh, you know year plus. We are slowly but surely chipping our way back up to those 2018 highs when the 10 year was yielding around three percent. That felt like a ridiculous upside objective a year and a half ago, we're getting there one one day at a time, one move like this at a time, we're certainly seeing a higher rate environment. Hopefully that is not a surprise to viewers of, uh, of the final bar. We have talked about the prospects of higher rates and their implications. Please go back to our previous discussions if you missed that. I think that's a key theme for 2022 and, and arguably uh, much further down the road. Commodity prices continuing to strengthen the DBC commodity ETF up 0.8%. Gold a little bit flat, but uh, finishing stronger uh, at the uh, at the end of the day. Uh, energy prices in general higher and energy stocks doing better as well. Interesting move in cryptocurrencies with uh, Bitcoin getting above 40,000. Yesterday was down around 36, 37,000 as we're doing the uh, doing the show. Today we're right back, uh, you know, getting back above that key 40,000 level. Bitcoin, look back at the chart of Bitcoin, you'll find big round numbers tend to be significant. So, uh, you know, that, that break above 40,000 and holding 40,000 over the weekend, I think would be uh, pretty important. Ether as well, increasing almost 10% today to uh, to finish. Where we're actually not finished; it's still open, but uh, where we're at currently around 29.50. On a sector basis, just very quickly, uh, this was consumer discretionary number one, up almost 3%. Now Amazon has a big weight in that. Uh, obviously, it's one of the bigger names in the uh, in the XLY. So Amazon up almost 14% is absolutely going to push those higher. That was the final. Uh, one of the FANG stocks to report this week. You had uh, Alphabet on Tuesday, Facebook on Wednesday, Amazon on Thursday. I, you know, I, I, one takeaway as I'm wrapping this week is just thinking about, you know, we tend to group the FANG stocks or what I call the FANMAG stocks, those six names as one group. When we talked about that group yesterday, we actually, or sorry, Wednesday, I think we did a deep dive on those six names and looked at each of them. They're actually fairly differentiated, right? They're not all the same stock right now. There have been times when it's all the FANG stocks moving together. Very much not the case here. And you see certain ones like Facebook gapping lower on earnings, charts like Amazon gapping higher. It tells you a lot about how some of these can be more and more differentiated. It may be worth thinking about them as separate names. Don't group them all together as one big stock. It's one of the takeaways I'm coming up with uh, this week. On the downside, you have materials, real estate, consumer staples. So when you're looking at that ratio of consumer discretionary to staples, certainly favoring consumer discretionary today, even though the last couple of months have been tilting toward the relative defense of staples. I wouldn't be surprised if that's where that trend continues to rotate. This chart is one we like to look at every Friday during this segment wrap of the week, where we look at the uh, weekly returns on some of these different asset classes. We're starting the clock um, last Friday at the close. We're now going to uh, to where we're at. Actually, I'm noticing that I'm not including uh, the last five days. So give me a second here. We'll back this up to five days. We start again. It was the holiday the week before. I need to update this one. 
So what we're going to do now is look at the last five trading days. Here we're starting the clock last Friday. What have the returns been of these major asset classes from last Friday to this Friday? The S&P right here in black is right at one and a half percent. Not a bad week, although obviously stronger uh, midweek kind of came off here as we uh, as we had Thursday and then today. Underperforming uh, the S&P this week, we have gold, uh, which was up only one and uh, one percent relative to the S&P's one and a half percent. The U.S. dollar index using the UUP was down almost two percent this week, and the uh, the most underperformer was uh, bonds. This is using the TLT as a proxy for bond prices, down two point seven percent. That's basically what happens when you have higher interest rates; bond prices uh, are coming down. Everything else sort of outperformed. Uh, the S&P uh, for the last week in purple, you have small cap stocks up 1.6%. In pink, we have the NASDAQ 100, the Q's up 1.8%. In orange, emerging markets up 29 And the big winner this week, uh, USO, the US uh, crude oil prices up 4.7%. The next chart, we're going to throw Bitcoin in the mix. Give me a second to add the fifth day here. So we're taking it from, uh, from last Friday's close uh, to where we're at right now. And I would imagine, given the strength that you saw in Bitcoin, it should be the number one performer. And here it is up 7.3% uh, for the week. What's funny is on Wednesday, it was uh, looking like the biggest underperformer in a significant way. Last two days, have really seen a rotation higher on cryptocurrencies. It's interesting. You know, I, I've, I've thought of cryptocurrencies recently as more of a proxy for speculation, right? Uh, when when individual investors in, in, in particular are getting more risk, uh, you know, uh, more, more open to risk, more uh, higher risk appetite, uh, you will see uh, you'll see Bitcoin and, and Ethereum go higher, although uh, we're seeing is a bit of a difference uh, to that thesis. I think this week you're seeing a lot of choppiness in cryptocurrencies again, continued downside, which could be an indication that uh, that investors overall are, are being more risk averse. However, a big jump higher today uh, following through to the upside that you had uh, yesterday for uh, for the major cryptos for sure. Let's complete our wrap the week segment looking at the Mindful Investor live chart list. This is a list of charts that I keep updated on stockcharts.com. If you've not seen those uh, charts before, go to the articles tab on stock charts, go to my page, which is called the Mindful Investor. You can get this uh, live chart list at any time. You're welcome to save them to your own login if you like and, uh, and do what you want with them. But uh, this is the list of charts that I keep updated. We'll start with the market trend model, which for me is looking at the uh, S&P 500 using weekly data and looking at three time frames. Long term model is looking uh, years down the road. The medium term model is looking really for the next uh, you know couple of months uh, to a year, and the short term model is looking for the next couple of days to the next couple of weeks. The short term model earlier in the day had actually turned positive, uh, given the close a little bit of sell off going into the close. It's actually keeping my short term model uh, bearish. The medium term model has now been bearish for three weeks. The long term model has remained uh, bullish, sloping downwards. But for me, it's all about the zero line and whether we keep above it. What this tells me, this combination of indicators tells me the long term trend remains uh, strong. Right. We're still in a secular bull market phase, according to the trends in the uh, in the S&P. The medium term model and the short term model, though, both negative, which tells me to think more about uh, you know, potential downside risk and less about potential upside opportunity. This is a time for me to be uh, updating stops, locking in profits, uh, defining levels of risk for current positions. And that's what I have been doing. And that's what I will continue to do until my model starts to turn uh, more positive, more constructive. The chart of the S&P sort of all over the place this week. Uh, you know, it's a really interesting week to look at Fibonacci retracements. Um, I, I, I find that these are really valuable once you've had a big move. So when you have that initial sell off in January and then started to, you know, uh, did not eclipse those previous lows, right, did not get much below 42.19, which is the low from uh, from late January, really good opportunity to put Fibonacci retracements on your chart. So we started at the high in early January, the low in mid January. Look at the key levels that were identified. 44, 47 is 38.2% of the way back up. That ended up being the high a couple of days after the uh, the S&P's low. Also was the low today, almost to the penny, right to that same 38.2% uh, retracement level. On the upside, the, or the last uh, Fibonacci level, 61.8% uh, is around 45.88. That was the high from Wednesday. So look at how the S&P has really traded around some of these key levels. Now, they also line up very well with 45.50, which has been an area of, uh, of support and resistance we've talked about many times uh, on the show. Also, the 200-day moving average, which was very close to what today's intraday low uh, has been. So we have essentially settled into a range within a range. If you look at the larger range, I would argue between 4,300 uh, and change on the bottom end 
4,700 plus on the upper end. We're sort of settled into that range over the last couple of months. Now we have a shorter term range with uh, the Fibonacci support and resistance levels based on the January trading range. I'd be very keen to see which way this breaks next week. We could very likely break below the 200 day break below Fibonacci support. I think that ex would, would mean expect a retest of 4,300 and even down to the uh, January lows to see if those would be able to hold. If we break above the 61.8% uh, the level, that would suggest a return at least to 4,700 and basically get into a rounding error uh, to retest the previous all-time high. So this week has sort of given us a new range within a range. I would look to see which way that breaks, and I would certainly expect the momentum to follow whichever way we break out of that short-term range. Now, the breadth characteristics have been pretty interesting. You can see I've color-coded these a little differently uh, over the last week because I think we've seen these breadth conditions deteriorate. Uh, over the last week, the NYSE advanced decline line has made a new low for the last uh, nine months. The small cap advanced decline line has made a new low for the last nine months in the last week, breaking below the December lows in both cases. The mid cap uh, AD line broke below the December low, but sort of came back above it. So I could argue that's more of a neutral uh, pattern at this point. And the S&P advanced decline line is the only one to make a new high in 2022 and also to still remain above it's December low. So what this tells you is a lot of the uh, small, medium names, uh, cap names have already broken down. The large cap names holding up is what is keeping this market overall in a condition of, uh, of still fairly constructive uh, looking at the breadth data. But uh, the rest of these, I think, look for, uh, pretty negative. So breadth has gone from overwhelmingly positive to more neutral to now more bearish to neutral. Uh, again, my webcast next Tuesday uh, for market misbehavior is going to be focused on breadth conditions like this one. We'll talk about some other takeaways we can draw from that information. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. What if you could look beyond price and identify big moves in the market before they happen? That's why we created the Moxie Indicator Minutes. Hosted by me, T.G. Watkins of Simpler Trading, the creator of the Moxie Indicator. Each week, I'll provide you details about the indicator, what it does, and how it can work for you. Only on Stock Charts TV. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we use stock charts to better understand this market environment. These are absolutely uncertain times and I've had a lot of fun with some of the guest uh, discussions that I've uh, we've been able to have on the show. I'd encourage you to go back and check out some of those previous interviews because some really thoughtful takes on this market environment and what to expect in the coming weeks and months. A couple quick announcements before we get to the final bar mailbag. First off, we welcome your questions. The mailbag we're gonna open up here in a few moments are all questions we've received from you in the last couple of days. Keep them coming. Anything is a fair game. Questions on technical analysis, particular charts or ETFs, charts we show on the show, guest uh, discussions and what you're hearing from them. Let us know what you're running into. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air in our next mailbag segment Tuesday of next week. Also go to stockchartstv.com. All of our previous guest interviews are there on demand. Also special events like the pitch, our market outlook series in January, so much more. Go to stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device, just search on any of the app stores for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let us continue on today's show, opening the final bar mailbag. Shoot us your questions at the final bar at stockcharts.com. Here we go. Our first question, a major bank strategist said today that he favors value stocks over growth, but with a defensive bias and not a cyclical bias. I know that defensive stocks are in the sectors of utilities, REITs and staples and maybe industrials. So how can we use stock charts to find value stocks that are in those defensive categories? Yeah, I'd encourage you to check out um, my conversation earlier this week with uh, Julius de Kempner. He did a great job. Uh, there's a new set of Morningstar um, sector classifications. You know, traditionally, we've all, I've always thought of uh, sectors as offense or defense, and that's kind of tough to group them that way because certain things are kind of offense and kind of defense, and it doesn't make uh, as much sense. Morningstar now breaks them up into three groups. You have cyclicals, which are sort of basic materials, consumer discretionary financials and REITs. You have defensive consumer uh, staples, healthcare and utilities, 
and then sensitive or economically sensitive uh, sectors, communication services, energy, industrials, technology. And, and that might help you understand it a little, uh, little differently. I've, I've traditionally sort of said offense, traditional offense would be things like consumer discretionary, um, traditional defense would be things like consumer staples uh, and utilities. Right? Think, think of things that you would only own uh, when the, uh, the market is, uh, is, is uh, struggling. And then you have sort of those economically sensitive or what you call the cyclical uh, sort of other cyclical sectors like energy and industrials. Uh, and, and thinking of those uh, in those buckets would be, would be helpful. The best way you can identify ideas, two things I would suggest you, number one, the RRG can be really helpful to help you visualize it. And what Julia showed on, the, uh, on this show on Wednesday was basically having three RRGs, one for each of those groups of sectors. That might be an interesting way to, uh, to look at how uh, those three buckets of sectors are doing. I would also use the scanning engine and, and some of the ways we've uh, highlighted on the show, which you can actually screen on particular industries within those particular uh, sectors. But that's where I would look for opportunities given some of those, uh, some of those other things. The other thing you can do is look at the scooter rankings, look at the scanning engine for charts that are in constructive patterns and see which sectors bubble to the top. That's another way to use the scanning engine, which can be a great way to identify what uh, stocks and sectors are actually doing, uh, getting it done and which ones are underperforming. Next question, I see numerous correlations between now and 1999 to 2000 with tech dramatically outperforming in 99 and beginning a multi-year sell-off while value stocks rallied in 2000 and post double digit gains. What do you see in the charts comparing the two periods? That's a really interesting question. Um, and what's tough about making that exact comparison, I'm just bringing up the weekly chart of the S&P. What, what, what is, uh, what's tough for me making that exact uh, you know, comparison is the fact that it's hard to uh, go on record saying we're going to have another uh, 2000, you know, beyond 2000 sort of bear market phase. That is not a particularly popular thing to go saying. And I, I think you'll find very few strategists, myself included, sort of pounding the table that that's what we're going to see. And it, it seemed, you know, it, it is easy to see how that played out in the rear view mirror. It's actually really hard to make that decision uh, as it's coming. So I actually am switching to a monthly chart of the S&P. So we're going all the way back to uh, the, uh, the late 90s here. So could we see another rotation lower? Absolutely. I mean, do you see the, I would argue that the trends are less in the charts from, from my perspective. The relationship that you're uh, describing uh, to me reminds me a lot more of just the anecdotal evidence, right? Uh, you know, one of my former Fidelity co colleagues mentioned that the way that they recognized that the market was toppy in 1999 and 2000, they went to a technology conference and they couldn't get to the bathroom uh, because basically the uh, exhibition hall with all these uh, technology stocks was so jammed with people that they literally couldn't get to the bathroom. And that was their indication that this is now played out. There are too many people sort of just buying into whatever technology stuff that they could. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the gentleman that managed the, uh, the, the Fidelity Electronics Fund, which is a big technology fund, was gaining like a billion dollars a day just on uh, inflows into the fund. And that was his sign that things were getting uh, toppy. I was talking with Mark Chaikin earlier this week, and we were just talking about some of the anecdotal evidence, just how you're valuing uh, companies. Uh, Greg Schnell actually made, made this point uh, when I was speaking to him earlier as well. I uh, just talking about, you know, what types of companies are doing well and getting, uh, you know, having uh, strong web views and eyeballs on the, on the information as opposed to legitimate businesses that are making money. You saw a very similar take there in the late 90s. Also, I would argue the influx of new investors is very similar. Um, you know, late 90s into the early 2000s, you had a lot of new investors trading in their Daytech account or their Ameritrade account and just trading tickers and not really knowing about the companies. I think you're finding a lot of that rampant speculation right now. However, I would tell you the market has a lot to do before you can start to feel that relationship between now and a period like 2000, 2001. And it involves the market rolling down, right? I think we're still in that environment where you're seeing signs, you're seeing narratives that could make the market go lower, but you're really not seeing a huge sell-off. You're really not seeing as much of a deterioration, especially in the top line averages that would make me make that comparison a little more directly. Uh, but that, those are some of the, the anecdotal pieces of evidence that I would uh, that I would point out to you. I should note, by the way, on the monthly chart, we just got a monthly MACD uh, sell signal at the end of January uh, for the first time in quite some time. If you look back, you can see when that monthly PPO is turned over, it's not often and it's usually before some of these cyclical sell-offs. And that's one uh, yet another reason why uh, I've been getting uh, way more cautious recently. Next one, much is said about how the popular stock indices are calculated, usually with overweighting the largest cap companies within them, but there's never any mention of the calculation of the individual Dow Jones industry indexes. Can you tell me how their components are chosen and how they are calculated? That's a really, really good question. So 
On stock charts, we actually use sort of an industry, uh, sort of a, a, a proprietary combination of using the 11 S&P sectors, but using the Dow industry groups. And we actually tweak them a bit in terms of where stocks and sectors are defined based on our own approach to how we want to group some of those names. So it is sort of unique to stock charts, how we're allocating them. But we do stick with the 11 S&P sectors at the top level because those are sort of the, uh, the main uh, distributions that people look at, main sector classifications people use. Industries are a little weird. So we have actually have our own methodology for linking the uh, industry groups into the sectors. If you go to charts and tools, you can see the industry summary tab. That's a good way to sort of see our breakdown between the 11 S&P sectors and the industry groups. And again, you'll, you might see, see things classified in different ways than you're familiar with. I will tell you, having spent years of time working with a lot of quantitative strategists and industry professionals on how to break down sectors and industries, it's impossible. There is no perfect way. And, and don't try to find one because I've, I've tried. There literally is no perfect way. And, and the reason is because certain stocks like media companies or internet stocks don't really make sense. Their businesses are too diverse. Amazon, where do you classify a stock like that? Because it kind of hits all 11 sectors in some ways, I, I feel like, right? So you do your best to try to, to classify them. Your question is on these individual industry sectors. And I from my understanding, I should probably have looked this up before I, I answer your question, but my best understanding, I believe they're all price weighted indexes, which is how the Dow is weighted, which means it is going to skew to some of the higher price stocks, but it's not going to be as exaggerated as um, as the uh, like something like the S&P or the XLY. Some of those sector ETFs and spiders, the S&P ETFs are all cap weighted, meaning the largest companies have a huge overweight in those uh, in those groups. In the industry groups that we use on, on stock charts, it mutes the overweight on the mega cap stock. So it's much more of a better uh, distribution. So the smaller companies are gonna have a little more weighting and the largest companies are gonna have a little less weighting when you're looking at the price data. But that is one reason why you're gonna find some different uh, distributions. I'm not, I'm not surprised you don't find a lot of clarity on that because data providers are notoriously uh, opaque in terms of what their data is. Uh, because they're very protective of it. But that is my understanding. These are price weighted indexes similar to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Dow Transports, and uh, others. That's all the time we have for questions. Keep your questions coming, and we'll hope to answer yours in our next mailbag segment Tuesday of next week. We need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes today, brought to you by our friends at Chaken Analytics. Go to uh, Stock Charts ACP to check out their uh, Chaken plugin on Stock Charts ACP. Chart number one is the 10-year yield. The rates jumped up big time today. The 10-year yield getting above 190 for the first time since the beginning of 2020. You have to go back two years on the chart to see the last time the 10-year was this high. That is not a mistake. I, I hope in terms of the trend in the 10-year, uh, we've talked about the prospect of rising rates. I firmly believe rising rates are a reality we will continue to have to deal with. The implications of a rising rate environment are something a lot of us have not dealt with in many, many years. I'd encourage you to go back to other periods in market history where rates have been uh, going up for an extended period. I think rates on the 10-year can certainly go much above 2%, even up to 3%, which would be the high from uh, 2018. Think about what that'll mean for growth stocks. That is not a great environment for growthy stuff to perform well. Uh, be warned uh, here. Chart number two, speaking of growth, the NASDAQ composite, nice bump higher after yesterday's sell-off. Uh, it's worth pointing out, though, that even with the bounce that you saw uh, today, we really just didn't even get above yesterday's uh, high, and we were very much still below uh, Wednesday's close. We gapped down a lot yesterday. We recovered sort of the intraday losses yesterday, yesterday but didn't get back above um, the uh, or back near the range that we had on Wednesday sessions. This is still growth stocks rolling over. I see the Nasdaq Composite is breaking down through key support around 14,200, uh, we'll call it, retesting that from below. And the question is, which way we, we resolve? I would assume based on higher rates, this probably resolves lower, but I'll let the chart tell me which way we are most likely to go. Finally, let's finish uh, this week on the final bar. Uh, with some uh, with some good news or, or some uh, encouraging charts. There are charts out there that are working just fine. Uh, and again, in, in market, it's like this, where the, uh, the there's plenty of uncertainty, where there's choppiness, where there's a rotation lower. I would encourage you to focus on parts of the market where the, uh, the, the charts are holding up pretty well. Charts where if you didn't know that the market was having so much volatility, you probably wouldn't notice it from the chart. Abvi comes to mind. This is an earnings name this week. The relative strength has been pretty strong over the last uh, six months. What I like about this chart is overall it's holding up just fine. Look for a chart like this to see if it's able to hold up on pullbacks. Uh, this chart, uh, as many will most likely pull back, is it able to achieve a higher low when it does so? And that's what I'd be looking for on Abby. But overall, this is a high yielding name in healthcare with a strong run of price. 
and relative strength. Folks, that is a wrap for this week on The Final Bar. Check out StockChartsTV.com for all of our previous episodes. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great weekend. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.